Good morning. If you haven't found your way there yet again, turn to the book of Genesis right in the front of the Bible, the very first book, and we will begin to study this first chapter. So famous, you've probably read it many times or heard it read. But what you see in this first chapter is the foundation for really the whole Bible, the whole rest of Scripture, and really the whole foundation of our faith, our understanding of God and who He is and His world. In other words, what is structured for us here is our worldview. Our worldview. What is a worldview? Do you know you have one? It's been said it's kind of like your belly button. You never talk about it, but you got one. Everyone has a worldview. And a worldview has been defined this way. Quote, a worldview or a world and life view, as some people call it, is the structure of understanding that we use to make sense of our world. Or it's our way of looking at life. It's our interpretation of the universe. And the most foundational question to our worldview, to our perspective on life, the way we analyze and look at and understand our world, our place in it, and who we are, the most important question and foundation to our worldview is this. Is there a God? And if so, what is He like? This forms the core of what our worldview is based on, whatever your worldview might be. This past week, Albert Moeller highlighted on his podcast, The Briefing, he highlighted an article in the Boston Globe that is particularly pertinent as we consider worldview and as we study here in Genesis 1. He opens this podcast this way. Here's the headline for you, quote, A Better Theory of Intelligent Design. Hack Misra contends, quote, the public perception of intelligent design is that it is a scientifically specious, religiously motivated idea that seeks to explain away the notion of Darwinian evolution through magical thinking. Some incarnations of intelligent design can fairly be described as such. And then Moeller comments, he says, Hak Misra says of the biblical worldview and even the idea of intelligent design that it's magical thinking. And then he goes on to explain that his own view of intelligent design, according to him, is scientifically credible, unlike the intelligent design or creation arguments as we know them. Now, Muller continuing, Heck Misra, the author, thinks that it might be that the universe, the cosmos, was intelligently, des- intelligently designed. But then that raises the question, by whom? And here is the answer in that Boston Globe article. It's a form of what is known as panspermia. This is a pseudoscientific word that insinuates that life somehow, as we know it, on this planet is the result of an intelligent intentionality by some intelligence there in the cosmos. Not a supernatural intelligence, but an alien intelligence from some other solar system or some other planet. Now again, this isn't the Boston Globe. This isn't some website or blog out there. This is a scientist commenting what explains the order and design of our world. He says the best alternative, or really the only rational one in his understanding, is that aliens populated this planet. Muller continues, he says, What it shows us as Christians more than anything else is the desperation of those who reject the biblical worldview to try and explain why life exists, why the cosmos exists, and more fundamentally, but in particular, why is there life? Why is there biological life? Why is there intelligent life? There must be a better way than aliens who have never been seen and never been known in these planets that might be out there, as he posits in that article. There must be a better way, and Genesis shows us the way. Shows us a way that is far short of magical, rather it's quite reasonable, it's quite true. Recall last week as we began Genesis and we looked at the overview of what the book of Genesis is about. It's a call to trust God. We trust that God exists and that he's faithful to his promises. And the story of faith launches from Genesis 3.15 with this initial promise, this call to trust God to be faithful 
to his promises. That promise that said the woman, excuse me, the offspring of the woman shall bruise Satan's head. And Satan will only bruise his heel. That is, in many ways, the text of Genesis before us here, Genesis 1, provides the reasons and foundations to why we should trust God. Why should we trust his promises? That is, in particular, Genesis 1 gives us the plausibility structure, the rationale, or you could say the worldview, that makes sense of why God is worthy of our trust, worthy of our life, and worthy of our obedience. So in Genesis 1, we're going to be looking at in the beginning. This is part 1, and we're going to consider all of these attributes of God in Genesis. But here's the, the big picture. It's this. We're going to discover or rediscover five foundational reasons, worldview-forming reasons, as to why you should trust God, why you should trust your Creator, why you should obey Him, even when you don't understand why you should, why you should just trust Him with enduring faith and obedience with and through whatever situation his created world may bring you. So we trust him. And we're going to see five reasons as we discover, as we see here in Genesis 1, we're going to see God creating. But as we see him creating and forming our world, we discover things about our God too and what he's like. Again, that creates the foundation and the reasons for why we trust him, why we obey him. We'll see first off, and look at this mainly this morning, because God is the almighty creator. We're going to spend all of our time there. No surprise, considering what Genesis 1 is all about, about his great power in creation. But this is why we trust him, because he has all the power. If you're going to trust in anyone, you might as well trust in one that has the strength and power to do something. Secondly, we'll see, Lord willing, next week, that he is the authoritative creator. He is the one who calls the shots. He is the one who interprets our world. Of course, then he's the one that we should be looking to to understand our world. Thirdly, we'll see that he's an orderly creator, evidenced in the way he makes this world, filled with order. And the process by doing so was rather orderly. We'll talk more about that. He's also then a purposeful creator. He has a design and a purpose why he makes the world. And this is why we should trust him. This isn't random. This world doesn't come from some random set of events. This is the intentional, deliberate work of our creator. Finally, we'll see that he is also the redeeming recreator. In short, we've messed up the good creation he has given us. And so then we see in his mercy, he doesn't leave us to ourselves, but he comes after us and he comes after all creation to make it right again. So that's where we're going to be going over the next couple weeks as we consider this God and the foundation of a worldview. But where we're going to spend our time this morning is with that first point that he is the almighty creator. As we look at Genesis 1, we're going to see at least three aspects of the text that highlight for us God's power, that show us his incredible strength and its depths, which are impossible to comprehend in in full. So we're going to ask the question, who created, as we come to this text in Genesis. Then we're going to ask, how was it created? And finally, we'll consider that question that of such debate today. How long did it take to create? Who created it? How was it created? And how long did it take to create? Because if we answer those questions, which Genesis 1 gives us the answers for, as we answer those, we cannot come to the conclusion but this, that God is the almighty creator. His power is really almost entirely incomprehensible. It's so grand and so great. And so that then is the reason why we trust him why we trust him in the difficulties, and why we trust him in our weaknesses, because in him there is strength, in him there is the power that we need. So first off, who created? Where did all this stuff come from? Did it come from aliens in outer space? That's certainly not the answer that Genesis gives, nor is it a rational one. But it's this question, who created and where did everything come from? And of course, the Genesis text leaves no room to wonder as the answer alone is God. He alone created everything. He is the sole creator. And of course, this is where verse 1 begins. In the beginning, God. There he is. He's before everything. He is where the story begins. 
creation story starts in the beginning, God. There was nothing before him. Nothing predates him like it reads in Psalm 90. Before the mountains were brought forth or ever you had formed the earth and the world from everlasting to everlasting, you are God. God had no machines. He had no partners with him to make this world. And he had no one helping him. His strength was not limited in such a way that he needed help. He did it all by himself. And in the beginning, it starts with him. And from him, everything unfolds. Furthermore, throughout Genesis, as you look at chapter 1, this overarching view of creation, God is the supreme actor or subject. He comes up time and again throughout this text. The word for God in the Hebrew, the original language, occurs 32 times in Genesis chapter 1. That's more than any other chapter in the Hebrew Bible. God is the actor. God is the doer. He needed no one's help. He stepped in and did it of his sheer power because he needed none. And nearly every time the word God appears in Genesis 1, he's the subject, the actor, the doer, the one creating, and he's the only one. I mean, just look as we scan through the text. Look here at the repetition and predominance of God's activity here in Genesis 1. Genesis 1, 3, and God said, let there be light, and there was light. Genesis 1, 4, and God separated the light from the darkness. Verse 5, God called the light day, verse 6, and God said, verse 7, and God made, verse 8, and God called, verse 9, and God said, and verse 10, God called, verse 11, God said, verse 14, God said, verse 16, God made, verse 17, God set, verse 20, God said, verse 21, God created, verse 22, God blessed, Verse 24, and God said, and verse 25, God made. Verse 26, then God said. Verse 27, then God created. Verse 28, and God blessed. Verse 29, and God saw. And verse 31, and God saw everything that he had made. And behold, it was very good. You know who Genesis 1 is all about? It's about God. It's about our God, who he is, what he's like. And we discovered he is the almighty creator. He is the source to everything. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And this has implications. We'll draw out more about these in the coming weeks. One implication just on the face of it, obviously, is this. He is your creator. He is the one ultimately who made you. Which means you are his creature. And he owns you. He has authority over you. He gets to call the shots. We'll talk more about this in the coming weeks. But this, you're not autonomous. You're not a law to yourself. You don't get to determine who you are and what you get to be like. Contrary to what our whole society wants to say about us, God created you. And you are accountable to him. And we all will be, with whatever fancies we pretend to try and be our own person, be our own individuals, to run our own life, in the end, we will all appear before his judgment seat. He owns you. You are his. And doubly down, Christian, brothers and sisters here, he has also then, because we rebelled, he bought us. (laughs) He bought us by the cross. He has reconciled us to himself and he's made us his own. And so like it says in 1 Corinthians, he says, therefore glorify God in your body because he bought you with the price. We are doubly owned as it were by God and we are his. So as those redeemed from sin and those redeemed by the blood of Christ and reconciled to God, oh, may we honor him, this one who has bought us, that our lives are driven and directed by his agenda, his order and dependent on his power. He owns you. Simply because you're his creature, but even more than that for the church, because we are owned by him, bought by him. Another implication for us is we see God as the only creator. In our troubles and our difficulties, which we've made ourselves, we'll talk a lot about that in the coming weeks. 
But as we run into troubles and difficulties in this world, as we see God as the Almighty, it poses the question, when we run into difficulty, where should we turn? Where should we look? To whom shall we go? Where does my help come from? Right? Psalm 121. I lift my eyes to the hills. Where does, from where does my help come? My help comes from the Lord who made heaven and earth. He will not let your foot be moved. He who keeps you will not slumber. Behold, he who keeps Israel will neither slumber nor sleep. He has the power. We, every night, hopefully, are evidenced of our finiteness and the limits of our strength. We sleep for hours, hopefully, many hours, more than some of us got last night. Because we need the strength. We can't do it. We can't keep going. But God, in his infinite power, keeps going and he watches over his people. The Lord is your keeper. He's the shade on your right hand. The sun shall not strike you by day, nor the moon by night. He will keep you from all evil. He will keep your life. The Lord will keep your going out and your coming in from this time forth and forevermore. In the midst of your difficulty, your trial, turn to him and find strength, protection, joy, mercy. Find the resources that you know you don't have because you've seen it in your weakness. That is what it means to walk in faith. That's what it means to trust the one who is the almighty creator because he created it all. Then we turn to this question as he is the almighty creator. We look and see in this text, it stands forth so evidently how he created He's the sole actor and he demonstrates his great power. But even the way God creates shows his power. A power that's hard for us to understand and it's without parallel in all creation. Even in our imaginations, we cannot imagine a God that's powerful. Because notice how God creates. Namely, God creates by his words. God speaks and things become. God talks and things that were not suddenly are there. Out of thin air, out of nothing, there is now something because God's word has sounded forth. It comes from him. It comes from his spoken word. Like we read in Hebrews eleven three, by faith, we understand that the universe was created by the word of God, the spoken word of God, so that what is seen was not made out of things that are visible. As we read in Genesis 1, you notice again, we just see structure and repetition throughout this chapter. And we'll discuss it a bit further, but you'll recognize, as we heard in the scripture reading, we see these repeated elements come forth. You can just look at that first day, starting in verse 3, and you see God said, and then he says something, and then it was so, Right? And then he looks at it and says, it was good. And then he'll name it. Like in verse 5, God called the light day and the darkness he called night. And then again, that repetition, there was evening and there was morning the first day. There was evening and there's morning the second day. There was evening, there was morning. Each move, each day is marked by God creating. And it starts with those, in English here, three words. And God said. This is how he created. Verse 3. And God said, let there be light. Verse 6. And God said, let there be an expanse. Verse 9. And God said, let the waters under the heavens be gathered together. Verse 11. And God said, let the earth sprout vegetation. Verse 14. And God said, let there be lights. Verse 20, and God said, let the waters swarm. Verse 24, and God said, let the earth bring forth creatures. Verse 26, and God said, let us make man in our image. The text repeats and makes clear for us that it's the creative word of God that is powerful and instantly effective. God speaks and it happens. What a mastery of power to speak and then it's suddenly there. We see that repeated phrase, like in verse 7. God made the expanse and separated the waters that were under the expanse from the waters and above the expanse. 
and it was so. He speaks, and then it becomes, verse 9, and it was so, verse 11, and it was so, verse 15, and it was so, verse 24, and it was so, verse 30, and it was so. He speaks, and it happens. So shall my word be that goes out from my mouth. It shall not return to me empty, Isaiah says, but it will accomplish that which I purpose and shall succeed in the thing for which I sent it. Incredible. Two things we certainly glean from this is that creation is an incredible feat. Whatever it means to get all of this stuff, okay, just even looking around us, all of our matter, all of our structure, to get all of that here from nothing, yeah, that's pretty special. It's incredible. It's mind-boggling power. But God does it with a word. What have you created with a word? That was good. (laughs) I've created problems. I've messed up relationships. I've sinned against others. He has authority and power in his word to take the things that are not and make them. Whatever he would determine, whatever he would declare. He brought into existence everything. Everything with a word. Curious to note, as you look through the Bible, and it talks about the work of God in creating, and it starts using anthropomorphic terms, meaning it gives God the picture of body parts to try and explain or illustrate what it was like when he created, because he doesn't have fingers, but it says in Psalm 8.3 that it uses Speaking of creation, that God with his, so to speak, fingertips makes the earth, makes the world, makes the heavens. But when the Bible talks about the great works of salvation, doesn't, he doesn't use his fingers as if it was some easy, artful thing. It talks about the hand of the Lord and his strong arm. Like in Psalm 98, Oh, sing to the Lord a new song, for he's done marvelous things. His right hand and his holy arm have worked salvation for him. So let me highlight for you, as mind-boggling as the great power of God to make all this world, and we'll talk more about it in a moment, how vast it is, but the great power of God to speak those things into existence in a biblical worldview is little compared to the great power it took to reconcile you to him. That is the incredible feat to have a holy God with a sinful person like Rick Zaman. That took the full power of God at the cross. And this is what the cross and the power of God has accomplished. Furthermore, not only is creation an incredible feat, but God's spoken word, or as we have it written down, is most powerful. Jeremiah 23, verse 29, he says, Is not my word like fire, declares the Lord, like a hammer that breaks the rock in pieces. To see the power of God's word, let's look at 1 Corinthians chapter 2. To go way right into the New Testament. Get past the Gospels, get past Romans, and there you are at 1 Corinthians. First Corinthians 2, and we'll see that the power of God evidenced through his proclaimed word. And when I came to you, brothers, verse 1, Paul's saying, he says, when I came to you, brothers, I did not come proclaiming to you the testimony of God with lofty speech or wisdom. That is, when Paul brought the gospel, he wasn't dependent upon his clever presentation or his oratory skill. Why? For I decided to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. The message he was bringing across with Jesus, death, burial, and resurrection. And he wanted this to be his plain message. He didn't want himself to distract at all from that which he was speaking about. 
Because he goes on in verse 3, And when I was with you in weakness and in fear and much trembling, and my speech and my message were not in plausible words of wisdom. Again, it's not about Paul. It's not about his oratory skill. Apparently, he calls himself, he's no Spurgeon or Whitfield. He was even weak and in fear and much trembling. No power of his own. So then you would conclude the end of verse 4, but it's the demonstration of the Spirit and of power. The power comes from God. Verse 5, so that your faith might not rest in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. The power of God and what the gospel did and accomplished and the power of God to change hearts, to bring them to faith, to belief, to find mercy at the cross. What a powerful word he has given us. By it he breaks and melts hard hearts, not by the power of the preacher, but by the power of his word. This is the power of God. Is that part of your worldview? Is that what you recognize God's word to be? Powerful enough to change hearts, to change you. When you encounter a problem, a personal one, some relational difficulty. Do you go to God's word for answers? Do you go there first for life? Or do you see this book as a a nice old book? I'm glad it's there. Gives me some comfort, some interest. But in the end, when I need answers and I really want solutions, I go elsewhere. Do you go to other places first? Because if you do, you're robbing yourself of the powerful word that God has given. You're robbing yourself of the very means God uses to change you and to change others. So that word complemented with his spirit is how he changes and transforms, alters our thinking, renews our mind, and transforms us into obedience in conformity to Christ. It's that word that's profitable for teaching and for training and for the equipping in righteousness. It's that word that contains and promises that contain everything you need, First Peter, excuse me, Second Peter says, that you need for life and godliness. That is his powerful word. May we not rob ourselves and others by going to lesser things. Back to Genesis 1. We see the power of God's word that he creates. He speaks and it comes into existence. He did it long ago in the creation of old and he does it afresh today as he puts faith where there was none, where he reconciles sinners to himself through the gospel. But God's power is on display in a third way, at least here in Genesis 1, with the answer to this question. How long did it take to create? God's unbelievable power stands forth in this text as God creates the world, the earth, the heavens, the stars, the universe as we know it, all that is seen and the unseen aspects of our world. He does it in six literal, measly little days. The Genesis text portrays God at creating everything in six days. In a span of six 24-hour periods, God creates everything. All creation. That's power. That's the power of our almighty God. Solomon took seven years to build the temple. 2,555 days. Took Herod 46 years to build his temple. 16,790 days. It took four years to build the Golden Gate Bridge. 1,460 days. The Empire State Building took only 410 days to create. The Space Shuttle Discovery took... 2.5 years or over 900 days to build. The universe, yeah, six. Six days. 144 hours. That's it. That's the power of our God. He built it all. The entire earth, the heavens, 
all that dwell in them. The stars. Oh yeah, the stars. The billion trillion of them. That's right. How many stars are in the observable universe? We're not sure, but it's some billion trillion. And I'm not just making up mathematical terms. That's a one with some 21 zeros after it. That's how many stars, flaming balls, are in the universe like our sun. And the Bible's saying that those things came to be in six little measly days. And actually, the stars in particular, we're talking about just one day, the fourth day. That is the power of God. Now, I know you're aware that the claims of science, and even many Christian believing scientists are, you could say, think a little differently on the matter. That is, the Bible appears to say that creation came to be in six days, perhaps as soon as 6,000 years ago, maybe 10. Science contends, however, that the universe is a little bit older than that. Yeah, through my limited searching, like a few billion years older. Uh, The seeming consensus that I could discover is that the universe, according to scientists today, is 13.7 billion years old. That's pretty old. And a little different than the testimony of Scripture, seemingly. Now, secular scientists, they don't think God exists and certainly don't believe that he created everything, let alone creating it in six days. In short, for the secular humanist science, their worldview doesn't allow for God. and So they'll never find him, and so they never wrestle with that question. But what is the Christian to do? What are we to do with the claims of science and the scientific community that are so divergent from the seeming straightforward reading of the biblical text? What are we supposed to do? How are we supposed to reconcile these two? Is that even possible? Or do we just stick our fingers in our ears and yell, la, 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 I can't hear you? Bible-believing, spirit-indwelt, Christ-loving Christians have suggested four more common attempts at understanding the text of Genesis 1. These are people that love Jesus, people that love his word. And not all of them amount to a, what we call a young earth or six 24-hour periods. Let me review those for you just for a moment. First off, there's the literary framework view. Okay? And it's evident. As you read Genesis 1, there's all kinds of structure in this passage. All kinds of the way things align. This was put together as a literary unit quite deliberately. And so then the argument from that perspective is... It's just an orderly presentation. It's not corresponding to history. It's a literary device. Another way to say it more simply is it's, in a sense, it's poetry. It's symbolic. It's not supposed to represent narrative historical events. It's teaching us theology and setting up our worldview, not giving us a history lesson, would be how the argument goes. Another way to try and explain or reconcile these is the gap theory. The gap theory contends that after you get through Genesis 1, 1, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, period. And then before you start verse 2, the earth was without form and void. In between verses 1 and 2, you can't really see it there. But in between those two verses, there was a span of billions of years. Maybe 4.5 billion. And then where God created and he made this world and it fell and it went to destruction under God's judgment. And then verse two, he starts over and he takes a creation from the mess that had been made and he starts that mess that is now without form and void and he starts to put it together into a new creation, this new creation that we now know. A third major way to understand this has probably been heard or understood by many of you, is called the day-age theory. So the way they try and explain how the universe could be so old and the Genesis text of chapter 1 be so true is that when it talks about a day, it's not talking about a 24-hour period. These are just days that, again, order the account. The days are like a thousand years or billions of years. They're very long. The point isn't how long the days are. It's just showing the sequence and the structure 
these creative periods, these very long, age-long days. Now, I'm sure you've noticed those three views, the literary view, the gap theory, and the day-age theory, they all allow for a much older earth, a much older creation, than does a view that assumes that a day is only a 24-hour period. Hence, it's much easier to try and reconcile those perspectives with the claims of science these days. But I would contend for the theistic evolutionist, the person who says God uses evolution, the creation is very, very old, and God just oversaw the process of evolution. And even each of those three perspectives, though to a lesser degree than theistic evolutionists, that they have, I would say, they, they're not truly giving voice to what the text itself says. That they are cowing to the claims of secular science and so then undermining the authority of God's word. People I respect, people I love, many people that I know to be Christians, they're regenerate, they trust in the gospel. And maybe some of those are you here. But friend, I want to encourage you and say, yes, that's true, that you trust in the gospel and you're with Christ, but I want to call you to greater fidelity to his word, to the plain reading of it. That is, they're letting the facts and findings of science twist or mute the plain teaching of Scripture, and particularly Genesis 1 in particular. Which leaves us with the fourth view, obviously the view I'm suggesting, and that's been the teaching of the church for, really, millennia. But it's this, that Genesis teaches that the creation came to be in six days. These days were 24 hours long. But before I give you some defense for that, I want to give you one question to keep in mind that I think really helps us understand why Genesis 1 teaches that there's, the earth was created in 24-hour days. It's this question. What is the chief goal of Bible interpretation? What's the question we're trying to get at, trying to answer? And it's this. What is the author's intent? And so we're trying to understand the Bible We're trying to get into the mind of the author and say, what did he mean when he wrote what he wrote? So we come to a passage, we're always asking the question, what did the author, in this case we're looking at Genesis, what did he mean? What did he understand? Now it's true that scripture is God breathed, so it comes from God, he's the big author, but he was using Moses, Moses' hand, Moses' mind, Moses' understanding as Moses writes this down. And I think the other views we've mentioned don't give proper weight to that question because there's so many indicators in this text that creation is actually very young and that the days are 24 hours. So first of all, why would I think that? Well, on the face of it, as we read about each day, how does each day end? It ends much like our days. There was evening and there was morning the first day. So when Moses wrote that and when the Israelites read that, what did they think? Were they thinking of very long ages that were suddenly light and then dark halfway through? I think they would have thought about the day they know, a 24-hour day. That is, there's nothing special or long about these days. They're just like the ones we know. Also, like I mentioned, some have contended that Genesis poetry, Genesis chapter 1 in particular is poetry, or maybe it's even myth, that it has no historical value. It's just a symbol Explain to us creation. Genesis 1 is not poetry. Hebrew poetry has some very distinctive characteristics that easily distinguish it from narrative, historical narrative. And the easiest way for me to show you, easier than teaching you all Hebrew, is this. You look at your Bible. You can look at your own or look up here because it's that easy of a visual. And you see that it's a big block text, right? Right? Yes, nodding affirmingly. Great. Okay. Then you flip over to Psalms, which is clearly poetry in the Hebrew language. And it's not like that. Much smaller lines indented continually. Because they are indicators when you're reading the Hebrew Bible, whether you're reading poetry or not. And when the translators recognize that, 
They show you accordingly with the way they formulate the text on the page. Narrative looks like this. Genesis chapter 1. See, in Hebrew narrative, you'll have short phrases, verses. You'll, you'll have certain grammatical pointers in the text. You'll see a lot of parallelism or coupling. None of those are found in Genesis 1. And that's why you should see it presented in your English Bible as a blocked text. Furthermore, a professor of mine, he had done all kinds of statistical analysis on grammatical structures, particularly in Genesis 1, to analyze its, if it's poetry. Or he's really asking, does it look more like poetry or look more like narrative, history? And not only does it look more like history than it does poetry, Genesis 1 is prototypical narrative history. It is, has the very defining features, all of them, of what history looks like. So my question or the thing I could pose is this. If Moses was to write down history and giving you an account of what happened, he has no other way to say it than what we see in Genesis 1. Another way to say it is Moses thought he was writing history. Moses didn't think he was writing poetry. Finally, that claim has been made that the word day in the Hebrew doesn't necessarily mean a 24-hour period, but it could mean something really long. And that's true, except when the word day is coupled with a number, an ordinal number, which is the way you find it throughout Genesis 1. First day, second day, third day. When that happens, every time it's a 24-hour period in the Hebrew Bible. Okay. What are we to make of all that? Why is that important? This whole discussion matters for a couple of reasons. One, God's word, his powerful word, must have authority over our hearts and over our minds. For those who are attracted or advocating for another view, I just challenge you with the question, why? What's your motive? Why are you turning from the seeming plain reading of scripture The historical understanding of the text. Why are you turning from it? Is it the text of Genesis that leads you elsewhere? Or is it because science says or scientists say? At that point, I just want to say, brother, friend, have you not let man's science and thinking trump the straightforward reading of God's word? Again, I'm not saying you are not a believer if you think the earth is really old or that you're a heretic or need to be removed from the church. I'm just saying, brother, you're being inconsistent with what else you have said about the authority of God's word. I'm calling you to trust fully the testimony of God found in the scriptures. By faith, we understand the universe was created by the word of God. That's why this issue is important. Secondly, the issue is important because of God's power. I would just pose that don't these long age views on creation undermine God's power? I'm sure some would say no, because that's the way they think God did it. But I contend, if God took such a long time, did he do so because it was so hard or so difficult for him? Was he not powerful or strong enough to make the earth in six days? See, the assumption behind evolution, you need such a long time, such a long period to make these processes work and develop. God doesn't need that. And he's told us this in his word. He doesn't at all give us the impression that he took millions or billions even of years. God said, and it was so. So we circle back to return to this almighty God and his powerful word. And this is what the Genesis creation account's been telling us, is that he is the almighty God. He exercises his power through his excellent word. And that forms the foundation of our worldview. Our view of the world and how we understand it is based on this, in large part, on how we understand Genesis 1. And we need this power. We need this power to trust and obey because we have doubting eyes. Because for us it is hard. We need his power to 
empower us to obey, to trust in difficult circumstances. Those occasions where you really feel like you have what it takes and then you have an outburst and you realize you don't. We need his power for those moments. Isn't anger a lack of trust in God's power? His power to accomplish his purposes. So you take things into your own hands. A lack of trust in his power to do you good, even when you can't see the good coming. And we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good by that great power. Isn't a lack of belief in his power as the Almighty? Isn't it a doubt when you've resigned yourself to sin or temptation? The powers of lust are too great. One more drink, one more click, one more time. To you, struggling saint and sinner, there's comfort in the powerful God. Thomas Watson says, The strong God can conquer your strong temptation. Though sin be too hard for you, yet not for him. Where and when do you feel weakest, tired, tried, ready to give up? I can't keep up with these kids. This job, this house, these bills, this marriage, I can't do it. I don't have the power. It's into that weakness the Almighty looks and He says, My grace and my strength is sufficient. Trust my power. Trust my strength. Ask me for it. Turn to Him. He is stronger. Let's ask Him to help us. Father, we thank You that You are the Almighty God. That Your power is greater than all. And your power abounds. It has really no limit. And that there is plenty that you have promised and given to us. Conquering our sin. Conquering death. We pray you'd conquer it afresh in our hearts. Conquer our unbelief. And conquer our waywardness. By your empowering word and spirit. For your glory we pray. Amen.